What makes humans special? We have language, creativity, intelligence. When I teach my biology students about microorganisms, I tell them about tardigrades. These tiny eight-legged critters can survive boiling water, frozen water, no water. In fact, they can even survive the vacuum of space. For every one of us, there are a billion of them. That sounds pretty darn special. Birds have grammar. Bonable apes play music. Octopuses use shells as tools. Every species has inherent worth. Every species is unique. Yet, like fish with water, every animal is reliant upon and utterly interconnected with many other species. Our human bodies are composed of more non-human cells than human cells. Without the trillions of beneficial bacteria living on and in our bodies, we would perish. Science taught me that we are living, breathing ecosystems. Science also taught me that in order to study life, first you have to kill it. Hello, I'm Lee Bevington. I love science and I love teaching science. Finding a way in this uncertain world requires us to reevaluate our role on the planet. I want to share three things with you. First, learning outdoors is vital to reconnect us with nature. Second, science without ethics is science without heart. And three, nature is an extraordinary teacher. What can we learn from nature or a frog? There's a pond I visit with my kids. Sometimes we imagine what the frogs might say. Your tongue is rather pathetic compared to mine. Or this pond is my home. You can't destroy my home. Our human-centered worldview says, yes, we can. After all, this frog has no value in her own right, which means we can pave over the pond without repercussion. Or so we think. Frogs absorb airborne toxins directly through their skin kill the frogs, and we lose these profits of pollution. Yet we mustn't try to save the planet just to save ourselves. That would still be human-centered thinking. Over 18 years of teaching science, I've witnessed a disparity between ecological thinking and science education. As Aldo Leopold said, instead of learning to appreciate and live on the land, Biology students are taught how to carve up cats. We've tried to separate ourselves from nature. Walls, cars, offices, screens. I wrote and practiced this speech outside. And there's a reason for that. In indoor environments, such as a sterile lab, I tend to think with my head. In the forest, I often think with my body or my heart. And I see this in my students. The lab can be tense, stressful, and competitive. You want me to go to the forest, or to the river, or to the ocean, something shifts. My students are more vibrant, joyful, and awake to the experience. I remember one student earlier this year whose eyes widened with unmistakable awe when a black-capped chickadee landed in her hand. How do we return to the roots of biology? Get outside. That's it. Okay, not really. There's more. Let's begin with wonder. I want to take you to a place I call the Sacred Mountain. I spent three days there alone, fasting, thinking, dreaming. On the second evening, I chased the sunset clambering over ridge after ridge until I reached a place where I could see 10,000 treetops. Hummingbirds, like miniature fireworks, danced their aerial acrobatics right in front of me. I sat in this ocean of dandelion seeds that were waiting for this very moment to release their seeds. And that's when I heard it. A sound 
curled its way into my ears, and then was gone with the whim of the wind. I cupped my ears to mimic the deer who share their mountain home with me. And that sound was a straight blast to my heart. Drums. The pulsing drums from grandmothers. Way down in the valley below, too far for me to see, our elder hosts were beating their drums. My heart wanted to reach out and embrace this sound, this transcendence. I received this gift, picked a dandelion, and blew. The seeds drifted down, greeted by the vibrations below. And in that meeting of seed and sound, I sat transfixed. And it suddenly hit me. I wasn't alone at all. My teachers were all around me. The mountain, the trees, the dandelion. This is what science is all about. Wonder. Experiencing and appreciating nature's wonders brings us closer to the idea of all life being sacred. Many indigenous cultures teach us this. Our children teach us this. My son went to forest preschool. On the wettest day of the year, I dropped him off and another dad and I went to a cafe. A few hours later, we get up to go and I notice that it's still really raining outside. So I search in vain for something to cover my head as I walk to the car, which is 10 feet away. Meanwhile, my son, outside this whole time, have been having the time of his life. Kids know how to turn a puddle into a wondrous science experiment. Let's jump from this preschool puddle to the post-secondary ocean. I have a friend who studied honors biology. For her research, she didn't want to kill any animals. The first supervisor she approached turned her down. Her compassion and wonder were a liability. Years later, during her PhD, she was placing these special tiles into the ocean to collect fish eggs. And this beautiful octopus befriended her. One day, she spotted the octopus reaching an arm down under a tile and treating himself to a meal. And then she discovered that the octopus had eaten every single fish egg in her experiment. Remarkably, she doesn't resent that octopus for ending her scientific career. Rather, she thanks the octopus for helping her realize that only when she left science could she fully embrace her love of the natural world. She now works in creative science communication and nature connection. This is her painting. How many biologists-to-be leave science because they don't want to kill life? In fact, this almost happened to me more than once. During my undergrad, I refused to do dissections, and I was told to consider another career. I continued my studies, protesting in silence, but I've come to realize that social justice is not accomplished by keeping quiet. We have to speak out loud and clear, especially for those who have no voice, or rather, whose voices we ignore or pretend don't matter, like the animals in a science lab. For dissections, we used to cut the vocal cords of living animals so that they couldn't scream. But to understand and care for the other than human members of our community, we need to hear their, their voices. A study led by Katie Taylor estimates that every year, 115 million vertebrate animals are used in scientific research. Vertebrates are animals with backbones, mice, birds, chimpanzees. A scientist can effectively sign off a form that allows the collective science community to use and often inflict suf suffering upon and kill 115 million animals a year. This is a conservative estimate because some animals aren't deemed worthy of being reported because they're not human enough. At this juncture, some of my point out that factory farms kill even more animals for food. 99% of meat production in the United States, according to the Sentience Institute, 
occurs in factory farms. And it's true, more animals are killed for food than for science, but does this make either right? This raises us another point. We are arbitrary in our treatment of species. One is kept in our home as a member of the family. Another is kept in a tiny cage until we kill them for food or for science. Imagine your dog being raised for meat. Imagine your cat being dissected. Probably doesn't feel very good. Imagine how it feels for the dogs that are raised for meat, for the cats that do get dissected. At 19, my mother visited a slaughterhouse and promptly became vegetarian. Scientists use the byproducts of slaughterhouses, including something called FBS. FBS stands for fetal bovine serum. And I'd like to see a show of hands from the audience. Who has heard of fetal bovine serum? So not many people. All right, this is going to get even heavier. I'm a scientist and science tends to come from the mind, but I'm also a poet. And sometimes I use poetry to express what's difficult to express. <sighs> Dear Calf, it begins with your mother slaughtered too soon. You are born an orphan, but only briefly. You are cut from the womb, an emergency cesarean, a fetus that has no time to conceive her mother's death. They are after your heart. Fetal bovine serum is extracted by inserting a needle into a calf's still beating heart. No anesthetic is used. A study, an alternative to lab animals, estimates that every year, one to two million fetuses are harvested. One calf every 20 seconds. There are times in life where you have to decide what's more important, your duty or your integrity. FBS, no, it's important to use the full name. Fetal bovine serum is commonly used in cell culture experiments for cloning, in vitro fertilization, and in teaching. I was teaching advanced cell biology. When I opened the fridge in the lab, and I saw that tray of fat blue cap vials, I felt my heart stop. I picked up a vial and I pondered the journey this serum had taken. The mother cow in the slaughterhouse, her uterus cut out and slid down a stainless steel chute. The worker who extracted the medium, the company that paid for it, the instructor that requested it for this lab, the lab technician that ordered it, and now the lab instructor who's about to give this to his students. That instructor was me. We were all caught in a system that said that this calf's life was less important than this learning experience. What does that teach our students? This was the moment where I had to decide. I felt sick to, the, to my stomach. An overwhelming sadness came over me. Things you're not supposed to feel in a science lab. I felt complicit in this chain of suffering. Yet, like everyone else, I had a job to do, and so I gave that fetal calf's heart to my students. So, what does this have to do with learning outdoors? Experiential outdoor education can cultivate a connection with the natural world. My students had no relationship with these calves. If they did, they might have protested. All right, let's take a deep breath. Now let's imagine a different world, a world where all life is sacred, where science is founded upon, in the words of Robin Wall Kimmerer, respect, reciprocity, and responsibility. Respecting the calf motivates us to find more ethical alternatives for fetal bovine serum. Right now, science education is human-centered. When you walk into a science lab, you walk into a room full of assumptions. Don't get me wrong, I'm a scientist. And through science, we have learned marvelous things. 
Our bodies build two million red blood cells a second. Trees communicate through their roots, and melting polar glaciers influence the entire Earth's climate. We've made a lot of progress, but the question remains, how do we align our actions with what we have learned? What can we learn outside the four walls of a classroom or lab? The chemistry of seawater, the geography of oceans, the physics of waves, the language of birds, the colors of photosynthesis, the biology of life, and the land as teacher. Being outside, students are reminded that they have bodies, that these bodies have myriad senses through which they experience the world, that the world is full of wonder, and perhaps they will have more respect, reciprocity, and responsibility towards the world because they know they are a part of nature. Here's one final scenario. Close your eyes and imagine that you're a student studying rivers. You're in a classroom, skimming through a textbook on fluvial geomorphology. You read about discharge, runoff, and flow, and never leave your desk. Now imagine that you're walking along the shore of the river. You dip your hand into the water, feel the strength and coolness of the current. Your feet push into the eroding bank, and you see, hear, and smell the salmon swimming upstream to spawn. Can you feel the difference? Nearly any subject can be taught outside. Nature is a teacher with infinite wisdom. Trees not only remove carbon dioxide from the air, they gift us with oxygen, food, climbing branches, medicine, soil stabilization, tools, and shelter. I imagine a way of being in the world that honors the land we walk, the water we drink, and the air we breathe. So get outside. Witness the flight of dandelion seeds. Walk with the rivers, and hear the voices of the earth. Humanity is in crisis. If we want to survive and address the origins of climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to acknowledge and respect all that is not human, to teach learners of all ages not to be citizens of science or the economy, but citizens of the planet. So, what makes humans special? As a species, we can eradicate entire ecosystems. We also have the power to save those ecosystems. Let's start with an educational model that allows our students to experience the world with compassion and wonder.